journalist of note. I'm sure you've read his uh, his Saturday essays. He tends you tend to get give, given the uh, historically themed jobs on the on the Saturday essays, and indeed many op eds as well. Um, and also author of numerous books uh, on modern history and earlier periods, and uh, most notably on, on my bookshelves, uh, Agent Zigzag, on the story, the remarkable story of Eddie Chapman, um, Operation Minced Meat, uh, again, another remarkable story from the uh, Secret Service files. Uh, and last year, I think it only came out last year, The Spy and the Traitor, the, again, thoroughly remarkable story of Oleg Gordievsky. Um, which, am I right in thinking that was only last year? Was it the year before, Ben? Actually, the paperback was last year. The, the hardback was, was, was the year before, yeah. You're, you're, being, you're being far too productive, I'm afraid. You're putting the rest of us to shame. Uh, but uh, your latest book, which came out in September of uh, this year, is, again, a, another gem from the, uh, the Secret Service archives, which is Agent Sonia, which is a thoroughly fascinating and interesting story that I'd never heard of this character at all so I wondered just to start off can you sort of tell her tell us uh, who she was and and in brief what she did well thank you Roger um I had never heard of her before actually I mean I came across her almost entirely by accident uh, I was researching a completely different corner of the forest if you like I was looking at a, at a, at a late wartime uh, American-led operation in which she had played a role. She played a role recruiting anti-fascist Germans in Britain to, 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 to sort of parachute into, into, into the dying Third Reich. Uh, and the Americans were recruiting them through her. What they didn't know was that, in fact, she was a die-hard communist. They were all communists. They were all spying for her. And they yeah. were all spying for Moscow. So, so I came to her by accident, really. And her story is, a, is an absolutely astonishing one. I mean, my claim that she is the most important woman spy of the 20th century sounds like the kind of thing with the, all our publishers stick on us. Yes. yes. She's not so with spies in history. She's you know, not the with Matter, but Murray's the most famous one. They, they tend to be agents, they tend to be um, couriers, they tend to be people recruited often by men to do specific things. The SOE yeah. agents I'm thinking of in the Second World yeah. War. Ursula is different, Ursula Kaczynski, because she is the only trained intelligence officer who was a woman I've ever come across mm -hmm. who rose as high as she did within an intelligence service and she became a colonel in the Red Army I mean I don't know of anybody any other woman who achieved that so she's a pro in that yeah. sense she's someone who really knows how to do this stuff and her starts in Shanghai in 1929 and ends in Britain in the tiny Cotswold village of Great Rollwright uh, mm -hmm. in 1951 so she spies for more than two decades. And in between, she ends up in Japanese occupied Manchuria, uh, Poland just on the eve of Nazi invasion, Switzerland during the war, and then Britain. So, so her story has this kind of extraordinary sweep that is absolutely uh, unique, I think. I don't think anyone else, anyone else did it. And for me, it was a kind of, I took the job, I took the, the subject on with some trepidation in some ways, because Ursula, not, not just because she was a woman and I was having to kind of try to imagine myself in, in, into that world, but also because she was a die-hard communist. Yeah. In lots of ways, her story came from the other end of the telescope for me. Yes. But, but, yes. but it's an, it, it, as, as in terms of span, I, I couldn't find another story that I like here. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the remarkable things about your book is, is not only its geographical spread, but, you know, its chronological spread as well. She's, she's doing this for a long time. And we should add that she is uh, instrumental in and has sort of very close contacts with a, with a number of sort of, you know, almost household names, I suppose, I mean, maybe to us. But, you know, certainly people like Richard Sorger, you know, she was recruited by Richard Sorger, I remember. Um, and then was was actually Klaus Fuchs's handler. So this is not a bit part player by any means, is it? No, she's not a bit part player. And I've often wondered why it is that her story hasn't been given more prominence. And it sounds like a very sort of obvious conclusion, but in truth, I think it does come down to a sort of sexism. I think because yeah. because the espionage world was so dominated by men in the middle part of the 20th century, yeah. her story was always subsumed. And she appears, she she's, comes into the sort of histories, but she's often on the margins. Actually, 
her role was much more important than that. She was right at the centre. And you mentioned Ricard Sorge. So that was her recruitment, really. I mean, what, what happened to Ursula? To understand Ursula's story, you have to really understand the context in which she grew up. She, she was born before the First World War, but grew up in Germany between the wars, in, in the sort of Weimar Republic, that tumultuous, chaotic era of, of great cultural efflorescence, but fantastic economic dislocation and, and furious political kind of conflict. So, so the right was on the march, the fascists were, were moving into power. And on the left, as far as Ursula was concerned, the only people opposing the rise of, of Hitler were the communists. And she came from a leftist family. She came from a well-to-do, really quite wealthy Jewish German family. She, her, her father owned the largest private library in Germany, a very literate world. Her father was a great friend of all sorts of fascinating people, Einstein and, 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 and lots of people on the left, lots of artists and intellectuals. So she grew up in this kind of great sort of intellectual world. So it's almost and a sort her, of salon world, is it? Yes, it was, salon. absolutely. Her mother was an artist and, and it was exactly as an East. And, and for Ursula, you know, we, we tend to look back on, on communism, obviously, and for obvious reasons, through the prism of the Cold War. You know, we see it for what communism eventually became. Mm. Actually, to be a communist, an anti-fascist communist in the 1920s in Weimar, Germany, was an entirely respectable, indeed, perhaps very courageous intellectual position to take. And for Ursula, it was, it was really, it, was, it wasn't a, it was a no-brainer to use a, a modern thing. For her, it seemed absolutely logical that communism was the way to stop fascism. Mm. And she, she, although she was a communist for the rest of her life, she described herself until her dying day as an anti-fascist. Yeah. And that, I think, is something we need to keep in mind when looking at a life like this, because there's a hinge moment in Ursula's life. For the first part of it, she's battling Hitler. She's trying to destroy him. She even tried to kill him at one point. And then for the second half of her life, for, for we in the West, her, her story becomes more complicated. Yeah. She's fighting against the West in the Cold War. Just to, just to go back, we'll come back to that hinge moment in a minute, but just to go back, what you just said about you know, that, um, that sort of seminal moment of combating fascism in Germany in the 1930s, that's very much the same position that, that um, someone like Eric's Ho Eric Hobsbawm comes from. Um, you know, because he grew up in that same environment. He had that you know, early conversion to communism. And, and again, he's someone who took his communism with him to the grave. I mean, there's a, there's a parallel there, isn't there? There is. Uh, and it is also the same rationale that is used by the spies that we know much better, the, the Philbys and Macleans and Burgesses were all considered. And, and don't forget, let's not forget that they, these people came of kind of adulthood at a time when the Spanish Civil War was raging. That, that great defining conflict where you know left and right were, were clashing in Europe. But the key thing I think is that some peeled away. Some, you know, the Malcolm Muggeridges of this world who had been, you know, sort of fairly, fairly committed socialists and, and, and communists, he wasn't a communist, but, but at the beginning of their lives, when they saw the reality of communism, yeah. they saw what, what it was really turning into under Stalin, yeah. they turned away, they peeled off. Michael Foote's a very good example. Michael Foote, later leader of the, of the, of the Labour Party, you know, yeah. he started, you know, believing in believing in this world and then moved away from it. So, the and George thing Orwell, is that, George Orwell, absolutely. The interesting thing is the people who didn't, the ones who stuck to it, and Ursula was undoubtedly one of those. You know, and she, she was, was you, when you look through her life, as you you tell it in your you know in your trademark, you know, engaging. Um, with a wry eye and with amusement as well. It, beautifully written, as always, Ben. Um, but she really sacrificed a lot to this cause, you know, through her life. She did. She did. I mean, I think I said earlier that she never wavered from it. That wasn't quite true. Mm. I mean, she had moments of extreme uncertainty. I mean, she was in Moscow during the Stalinist purges. Many of her friends and colleagues, her closest people, were destroyed by um, she, she lived through the molotov ribbentrop pact when, the, you know, that, that for many communists, that terrible moment when the, the enemy was suddenly in bed 
with the, the person that, that you know that the, the story that they've been telling and that was a critical moment for her and then much later in life you know the invasion of hungary the, the destruction of the prague spring in, in czechoslovakia in 1968 these were terrible moments for her so she wasn't an unthinking communist she wasn't a, she wasn't if you like a sort of didactic communist who didn't investigate her own beliefs yeah but she did pay a price i mean she paid a price emotionally too and that's the other great struggle within this book really is ursula's i uh, very genuine and very heartfelt efforts to reconcile what she saw as her ideological duty to communism um as a spy as, a, as an intelligence agent and on the other side of the balance her responsibilities as a wife mm. and a mother she had three children by three mm. different men and she took her motherhood extremely seriously and mm. those two elements of her life were always in conflict and right to the end of her life she wondered whether she had been a good spy but a bad mother mm. i mean it's interesting you, you there's an an element there must have been some very frantic compartmentalization going on throughout her life um but you mentioned earlier on the fact that you know the fact that we have not really uh seen her for what she was historically is partly down to her gender that people routinely overlooked her but that was also part of her sort of cover as well as a, as a spy, wasn't it? So she did use that. And she used her family also as a cover by extension. Oh, absolutely ruthlessly. I mean, yeah. she was, you know, her, her gender was her greatest disguise. Mm. Uh, and she knew it right from the beginning. She, it's fascinating, actually. I mean, the Chinese secret police, the Japanese Kempetai, MI5, MI6, the FBI, the Gestapo, the SS, the sweet the swiss security service they all overlooked her because mm. she was a woman i mean there are these extraordinary <laughs> notes in her mi5 file and i'm not exaggerating here where where the mi5 officer says well we've been to investigate this is jump much later in the story we've been to investigate this is burton and it can't be her because she has three children and yeah. and her husband works in the aluminium factory in chipping norton so it's definitely yeah. you know she's she's too occupied with her domestic duties but actually was a canny a really canny creature and she worked out very on, early on in her career that the more children she had the better was her cover gonna be because they really weren't gonna get her and i think difficult things for her children particularly later in life they didn't realize who ursula had really been until they were in their 30s and 40s was the suspicion well grounded i think that in, to some extent she had used them mm. to kind of protect her espionage life yeah and also had put them at jeopardy i mean the reality is that as she wasn't just risking her own life in this story she was risking the, the existence of her family had she been caught in switzerland for example she would have been deported back to nazi germany and they would all have been destroyed yeah. so the jeopardy is, is very real there and her her eldest son um, michael hamburger who i interviewed very shortly before his death earlier this year um at the age of 91 or whatever he was said you know it's been a very difficult thing to come to terms with the realization that my mother was not the person that i i thought she was and he said, perhaps in my life, he said, I've been married and divorced three times. He said, perhaps my problem was that I never really learned to trust anybody. And I thought that was a really interesting, actually very poignant insight into yeah. the, as you said at the beginning of the question, the emotional cost that these stories carry with them. Yeah, indeed. I mean, that's, that's fascinating. So there's a sort of fundamental um, lie there in his life that, that uh, he never, never really shook off. It's interesting. Um, I'm interested in uh, this aspect. You touched on it a little bit earlier on, this idea of a hinge moment and how, you know, she, she, is, she lives a tremendously long life and you can almost see her life as a sort of a microcosm of, of uh, you know, communism in the 20th century. But there's this hinge moment where, you know, from being on the side of the angels, they are then suddenly not. Um, tell us about that and how it plays out in her life. Well, it's, you are you, you absolutely right, Roger. You put your finger on it. I mean, you know, she was very young when the Bolshevik Revolution took place mm. and very old when the Berlin Wall came down. Her life spans the whole of communism from its sort of pure ideological beginnings to its chaotic, yeah. sclerotic downfall that we all remember so well. So she yeah. really does cover, cover the, the base. She would have said that her life was a model of ideological consistency. 
she would have mm. said, you know, I always followed the same path. Interestingly, in later life, when the truth about Stalinism emerged, she said, and, and I, I think she said this very honestly, she said, I didn't do this for Stalin. People have taken the revolution and, and turned it the wrong way, but I did it for pure motives. It, what, people have got this wrong. People have, have kind of taken the, the, the ideas of Marx and Lenin down the wrong route, but, but those are people, the ideas themselves are still pure. Mm. But there is this hinge moment. I mean, I think it's quite interesting. I think we in the West took a long time really to realize that the Soviet Union had, had, even though it was allied to Britain and America during the, during the war, was still spying energetically yeah. on, on the West as hard as it could and indeed had laid its sleeper agents long before the outbreak of war. So there was a consistency on the Soviet part that sort of never ended. Yes, but that's, but, a, that's but, a very good point, Ben. And I'll just, just interrupt you because, as I say, we talk about this hinge moment and we see, from our perspective, we, we see the Soviet Union changing sides in forty one. You know, because it's attacked by by Hitler, it changes sides. Um, but in a sense, you know, in a sense, it's us that aligns with them because they are defending their own interests. That's how they would, anyway, um, have justified the Nazi-Soviet pact, the earlier period of collaboration with Hitler. And they are just from then on defending their own interests, and that means spying on us as well because there's this yeah. fundamental antipathy to Western capitalism and uh, imperialism just as there was to fascism. So we're, we're, we're kind of viewing this from a very Anglo-centric or Western-centric position, really, aren't we? It's something that I think your book tells us, I think. No, I think that's absolutely right. And, you know, it, it's a painful thing for us to kind of accept, but in a way, the Soviet alliance with Britain and America was just as much an alliance of convenience yeah. as Stalin's alliance pact with, with Nazi Germany under the molotov River. They were, it was all about maintaining the revolution, maintaining Soviet power. And so from, from Moscow's point of view, echoed entirely by Ursula, she was absolutely consistent. It, it's the West that changes. And I think she would have rejected, and she did reject very strongly the idea that she had somehow turned against Britain by yeah. spying against Britain. She was actually, in, in, and this sounds a strange thing, actually very British in lots of ways. Mm. Her children were brought up in British schools. She adored Britain. She was actually very patriotic about Britain. And she would not have said she was spying against Britain. She would have argued, actually, I'm doing, I, I, I'm serving Britain by trying to create the revolution in Britain, by bringing Britain into communism, by creating world revolution. That's what Britain needs. The fact that Britain didn't want it was not really the point from her point of view. Yeah. And it's quite interesting. Her, her two surviving children, there's only sadly one now, are very British in their way. They were brought up in the Oxfordshire countryside. They speak this lovely 1940s English, mm. laced with lovely sort of old-fashioned Britishisms that you wouldn't sort of hear normally in, in Britain now. So, so it's it's rather. I think for her, it's interesting. She she sort of she would never have accepted the fact that that history had put her on the wrong side. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Can you just tell us a bit more about that British connection? So, how when she arrived in Britain and precisely what she was doing uh, while she was here? Well, her British period was really the kind of purple patch for her. It was, th that, was the, that was the high point of her espionage. And she came from Switzerland, where her spy network there had been exposed and was in great danger. And she'd married an Englishman by this point. So she had a, a British passport. She could get into Britain as Mrs. Burton. And she arrived and she set up shop in a, a series of, 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 of places, really. But she was ended that, up in the village that a of tactical Britain. marriage, may I ask? Was that a well, it began as a tactical marriage. Yeah. Absolutely. It was purely a, what they called in, 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 in French a mariage blanc. It was a kind of marriage of convenience. Yeah. The truth was her husband, her, her second husband, Len Burton, had been in love with her from the moment that he met her. And he was actually her sub-agent. She'd recruited him to spy right. inside Nazi Germany. And when she said, Len, you know, will you marry me because I, I need a passport? I promise you we'll cancel the marriage as soon as you like. He was actually very offended. Um, <laughs> because in fact, he'd already fallen in love with her. And fascinatingly, it was a marriage that lasted the rest of their lives. You know, it was, it was one founded on a deceit. Yeah. They ended up working for the, for the rest, of rest of their time together. So, and they had one child together and it was very happy. Um, so There's a film in that then. There is, isn't there? The accidental, the accidental marriage, um, the accidental love affair. But 
it's interesting. I mean, her, you know, she um, she really went into it in a very cynical way and fell in love herself. So there is this sort of strange accidental love story in the middle of the piece. But but no, so she ended up in Britain and, and her family had already moved here. So her, her brother and her father and her mother and her sisters were all in Britain. Her immediate family all got out of Nazi Germany and survived. Her wider family did not. I mean, they yeah. were they were they were wiped out. But but so she came via Britain to to well, rather she ended up in Britain and she lived in a variety of places, but ended up in the little the Oxfordshire village of Great Rollwright, which is a charming little inconspicuous hamlet uh, on the edge of the Cotswolds. It's a place. It's it's actually the last place in the world you would ever imagine uh, a spy would be operating from. And if you'd met Mrs. Burton in 1944, there she was with her three children and Len, and, you know, she baked apparently very superior scones and she went to the local church and she was a pillar of the local local establishment and so on. But in the back garden, in the privy, um, she built a very powerful radio transmitter with which she was passing the atomic secrets to Moscow. Because among Ursula's actually many agents, she had a very wide network in Britain, some of which she'd inherited, some of which she kind of forged herself, was Klaus Fuchs. Now, Klaus Fuchs was the prodigiously talented German physicist who'd, who'd escaped from Nazi Germany, he'd fallen foul of the, of the Nazi regime, welcomed by the British scientific establishment, who was working in what was codenamed the Tube Alloys Project, which was mm -hmm. the top secret Anglo-American project to build the secret nuclear weapon to, to, uh, and to keep Russia out of it, interestingly. So we talk about consistency, you know, the, they were all allies, but the truth was Britain and America were building the bomb for Britain and America and, yeah. and the Soviets were being kept out of it. And, and Fuchs became Ursula's most important agent. I mean, he was, he, over the course of their time together, he passed over 570 pages of what were really blueprints on how to build an atomic bomb. And when the Soviets eventually detonated their bomb, in 1949, that was partly down, largely down, perhaps, to Klaus Fuchs and Mrs. Burton of Great Rollwright. Remarkable. So she absolutely deserves her place in history in that respect. Yeah, and I think she's one of very few, I mean, it's a funny thing to say, you know, for someone who's written so many books about spying, but spies on the whole don't, I think, make a huge amount of difference. Yeah. I mean, spies, when they're, you know, they oil the wheels of traditional diplomacy. They can sometimes be very misleading. Politicians tend to give preponderant weight to secret information that may not be better than any other sort of information. Mm -hmm. It's been obtained secretly. It doesn't necessarily mean it's right. So yes. spies can, can actually be very destructive. Sometimes they don't make any difference at all. But when they work, when espionage works, and we know the examples, Operation Mincemeat, you know, the D-Day deception, the Enigma secret, it really does change history. And this is one of the very few, one of the really very few spies I've ever come across who has a dramatic effect on the way states behave strategically. Um, that sounds again like a slightly extravagant statement, but yeah. would would the Soviets have built the bomb without Ursula and without Klaus Fuchs? Probably, eventually. Would they have done it so quickly? I think definitely not. And how did uh, MI5 miss her? <laughs> She's right there under our noses uh, in the, the late 1940s. How did they miss her? From the moment that Ursula arrived in Britain, she was being followed yes. by, the, by MI5. I mean, they were absolutely... She knew was already a person of interest right at the oh, beginning. Yeah. So how, she how did the they miss her? She ended up on the blacklist, as did her whole family. These were a kind of, to use their phrase, a nest of communist... Germans in the middle of Hampstead and then in the, and, you know, we should be, and there are 79 files on the Kaczynski family in, in, in the National Archives from MI5. I mean, they were watching them closely. How did they miss well, her? How did they miss her? <laughs> it's that remarkable. Well, I do think one of the answers is old fashioned sexism. Mm. I mean, the thing is they were much more interested in Len, her husband, who was in fact her sub agent, mm. who she had recruited, than they were ever interested in Ursula. They got close to her in the end, there's no doubt. I mean, again, there's a hilarious note. I mean, uh, there are in, in her MI5 files where a policeman is sent, is dispatched by MI5 to kind of look at the building and he says, well, there's nothing to report about Mr. and Mrs. Burton. They're very quiet, they live a very quiet life. But um, I've noticed that there is a very large aerial on the outside <laughs> of, their, of their house. 
Uh, you, and it, this is a note to MI5 where he says, you may think this worthy of closer investigation. Well, they didn't. They didn't. They did not consider it worthy of closer investigation. There was, however, one person within MI5 who did suspect the Kaczynskis deeply. And perhaps it would have taken a woman to have spotted this. And her name was Millicent Baggett. She went by the unimprovable name of Millicent Baggett. And yeah. she was the only woman in the counter, the, the Soviet counterintelligence section of MI5. And she was straight out of central casting. She was unmarried, she was formidable. Uh, she wore a hat indoors. She sang in the bar choir. She lived with her nanny in Putney. She never, you know, she didn't suffer fools gladly. She was actually the model for John le Carre's uh, Connie Sachs um, mm -hmm. in, in his novels. And she consistently said, we need to get across the Kaczynskis. Th these people are dangerous. We, we, you know, they, weren't, they didn't know yet about the Soviet link, but mm. there was enough evidence around. And yet and they- At least the bloody great aerial. Well, there's the aerial. <laughs> but there is, of course, a long running sort of conspiracy theory attached to this, which is, uh, which some of, some of, some of the, the, the audience tonight will know about, I know you will, Roger, which is the story of Roger Hollis. Uh, Roger Hollis, um, as many of you will know, rose to become the head of MI5. At uh, this point in, in, in history, he was head of the counterintelligence section. So he was he was Ursula, he was uh, Millicent Baggett's immediate boss. But in the 1920s, the late 1920s, he'd been in Shanghai at the same time as Ursula was um, uh, recruited by Soviet military intelligence by Richard Sorge. I mean, he knew those people. He'd been a communist sympathizer. And there's a long running theory that Roger was actually protecting not just Ursula, but others like her, that he was a long time Soviet military intelligence agent buried deep in British intelligence. And this comes from Spy Catcher. And it's, you know, it's, it's the story of the kind of the mole within that has long kind of really, you know, for many years, it tore MI5 apart. Yeah. So, so was Roger Hollis protecting her? Was he stopping her from being caught? And she deliberately made trouble about this. I mean, after the after the after she got away to East Germany, she deliberately seeded suggestions that maybe someone in MI5 had been protecting her. I mean, for, there are really only two ways I think to look at that conspiracy theory. Either Roger Hollis was a traitor, was a term Soviet mole, or he was just completely incompetent. Yeah. Which I think is, there's a strong argument, and I, I certainly lean towards the latter. Yeah. I mean, in order to have been a super spy deep inside MI5 for 20 years, you'd have to be absolutely brilliant. You'd have yeah. to have remembered every lie you'd ever told and the compound lies and the way they'd worked and which bit was moving where. No one ever accused Roger Hollis of being brilliant. <laughs> I mean, he, was a, he was a sort of plodding bureaucrat i mean he was he was a kind of he just he didn't have the intellectual wattage to do what he was supposed to have done and yeah. i think the secondary argument is that had he been a super spy had there been this person at the heart of the british establishment the heart of the british intelligence world kind of protecting everybody do we really think vladimir putin wouldn't have told us about it by now yes i mean he'd be a hero, you know he'd be a hero not just for the soviet union but russia we'd have, you know they'd have opened up the archives which must yeah. would be voluminous not a word nothing yeah. like that has ever happened so i think that both the kind of practical and the political militate i think it was really just basic incompetence yeah. on my wife's part which does back up you know my usual uh, sort of counter to conspiracy theories is that you know 99 cases out of 100 it's it's not conspiracy it's cock up absolutely so this rather backs that up i think <clears throat> so yeah. I mean, to give, to give mi5 their due i mean the truth is they weren't focusing on the communist threat at yeah. the time when she was in her heyday during the war so they were focusing on the german threat and they dealt extremely as we know extremely effectively with with german espionage they just weren't they'd taken their eye off the ball really yeah and she ends up in east germany um and 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 is there for the uh, for the collapse of communism in 89 how did she take that well, I mean, yes, I mean, in a way, the latter chapter of her life is one of the most extraordinary, really. She, she got out from Britain just, I won't give away how she did it, but, but MI5 were closing in when she got out. And it's, you know, it's incredibly exciting the way she did it. But no, so she popped up in East Germany and she completely reinvented herself as she'd done throughout her life. You know, wherever she ended up, she became someone new. And, and in East Germany, she not only renounced um, spying, which is a very difficult thing to do. I mean, joining the Soviet 
Red Army Military Intelligence. It's quite an exclusive club. Getting into it is hard enough. Getting out of it is very tough indeed. But she yeah. just walked away from it and was allowed to do so. And she reinvented herself as Ruth Werner, novelist. She became a highly successful author of children's fiction. She sold hundreds of thousands of copies. In fact, she was once described as East Germany's answer to Enid Blyton. Um, she, did, she did incredibly well under a different name. But yes, when the Berlin Wall came down, Ursula's world, and she was then in late, late age, I mean, she was already in her 80s. Yeah. I think her world really collapsed. And her sons were very um, eloquent on it. said that their mother really came to realize that the truths that she had espoused all her life were falling apart in chaos and destruction. I mean, she remained a, a, a communist, a sort of communist socialist to the end of her life, mm -hmm. but she admitted that she was deeply disillusioned, that, that much of what she had believed was true had turned out to be a lie. And that's, it's very poignant in a way, but in a way it's a great tribute to her that she was honest enough, she was able to see her own life clearly enough to admit that at the end it really hadn't gone the way she was expecting. Yeah. One thing that comes across very strongly, I think, in your book is is a sort of, I think, more than a whiff of, of admiration for. And I, I found her very ambivalent, but it, it, certainly your closing comments are very, uh, are very sort of glowing in admiration for at least parts of her character. Can you just flesh that out for me? I ended the book fairly ambiguous about Ursula. I mean, she had extraordinary qualities. I mm. mean, she was resourceful, she was brave, she was tough, in a way that only someone who'd been through the worst of 20th century history could be. Mm. She was, you know, she was loyal, she was tremendously good to her, to the people that she knew and her children. She had a great capacity for friendship. Um, she was entertaining company. I mean, I took on the, <laughs> her story with some trepidation in some ways because, you know, diehard communists can be the most terribly boring company, you know, finger wagging, telling you about, you know, the dialectic and which way is up and which way is down. Actually, she was great. She was great fun to be with for the three years that I was writing this book. Yeah. But on the other side of the ledger, Ursula was the agent, often the unquestioning agent for a brutal, repressive Stalinist regime. Mm -hmm. And she was on the wrong side of history. She got it wrong. Um, and did she fully admit that? No, I don't think she ever really did. The one question I would love to have asked her, um, obviously she died before I came to the project, would be how much did she really know about the Stalinist purges? in 1937, 1938. I mean, when her friends and colleagues and everyone she knew was being wiped out by Stalin, how much did she really know about that? In her writing, she says, oh, well, I didn't really know about it. And they must have made mistakes, that kind of weasel Stalinist word for people who'd been murdered who were completely innocent. Most of them were completely innocent. So look, Ursula didn't have blood on her hands. She never killed anybody. She was never involved in, in, in anything like that. But she got it wrong. And, and so one has to balance, you know, the qualities that I do admire in her with, with the mistakes that she'd made. But I wonder if you'll agree with this, Roger. I think we tend these days to look back on history as a kind of moral accountancy in some way. Yeah. That, that we're, we're looking for lessons in how we are to live our own lives. And, you know, the past is either good or it's evil. And people are either on the right side of history or the wrong side of history. And the, and the goodies win and the baddies lose. And that's how history works. Well, actually, of course, that's not how history works. It's certainly not how espionage works. It's not how life works. Mm. So if one is looking for a simple moral fable, Ursula doesn't provide that. Agent Sonia is, a, is you know, she's a complicated person. She's not a kind of, you know, James Bond-like character with, a, with you know, a, a woman spy with a pistol in her, in her purse. She's not, that's not... That's not what we're dealing with here. So I wasn't really trying to, you know, she said she is a complicated character. And I think if I, if I achieve one thing, I hope in this book, it's that we try, that I was trying to see somebody within the context of their times. Yes. To try to understand how somebody like this could emerge from the world that they were in. So it, I hope it isn't, it isn't a sort of finger wagging, you know, bad, bad, bad person, bad communist, you know, not, not good. Because actually I think that simplifies 
the world in a way that isn't very helpful. And we see this with the tearing down of statues and all sorts of things today that somehow we want to simplify and, and codify and, and sort of stratify history. Whereas actually the point about history is that it is, it is complicated and at its best it is challenging. And it asks you, the only point of writing books like, like yours and mine is to ask, what would you do? Yeah. What would you as the reader, how would you in this circumstance, in this world, in circumstances not of your making, how would you have behaved? Mm. Fascinating. A last, last question before we move on to, to sort of throw the floor open, virtually speaking, um, is to just sort of ask you about sources and so on, because, you know, th these are... Um, this field that you've worked in with, with um, secret agents and so on is not necessarily one that has a wealth of sources. Um, but how did you find this one? Although with this case, I was astonished by how much was out there. I mean, uh, I'm very lucky, we're both very lucky, to work in this mid-century period, where, which is tremendously literate. I mean, everybody wrote everything down. Yeah. You know, everyone wrote letters and memos and diaries and postcards and so on. So they which we've come out the we've come out the other end of now. We, we're now oh, well, we have. I mean, God literature. knows what what historians of the future are going to do exactly. at our age because I mean, nobody keeps emails, nobody keeps text messages. How, how are they going to do it? Yeah. But no, I was extraordinarily lucky. I mean, in addition to the MI5 declassified files, which I mentioned earlier. So the official sources are MI5 declassified, the Stasi archive, which is astonishing because. Ursula was spied on by the Stasi. I mean, you know, they were following her very closely. Um, and she asked for permission to write her own memoir in the 70s um, as, as an agent. And they said, oh, yes, that's a very good idea, thinking there was a pro propaganda opportunity. And so she did write her memoir. Um, but the Stasi, which was a rather prissy organization in its way, disapproved of quite a lot of what she'd done in her life, you know, the, the right. love affairs and the children out of wedlock and so on. And they said, well, you can't possibly write any of that. So what she published was a rather sort of bowdlerized version, a piece of sort of communist propaganda. But being the Stasi, they kept the original manuscript. And that is in the Stasi archive. So I was able to plunder all the stuff the Stasi didn't want you to know about. Yeah. And then there was the family, her two surviving children, the two sons, who were understandably suspicious when I first turned up. I mean, I, I actually tracked them through the telephone book and just simply called them. And they said, you know, understandably, I mean, biography is burglary. I think they were very worried about, you know, here's somebody who's come along who is going to sort of take our mother's life. But I got to know them very well. And they were incredibly generous. They simply said, help yourself. And they had this amazing private trove of letters and diaries and thousands, and I'm not exaggerating, several thousand photographs from her life. And they simply said, help yourself. I, I've actually never come across family members of, of someone that I'm writing about who were who were so generous with what they had and they didn't try to control anything they simply said help yourself write whatever you want to and and many interviews with them so that allowed me to kind of tackle the the sort of emotional side of her because a lot in there including many many of her writings that were never published gave me the opportunity to sort of try and find out what Ursula herself was like yeah and I thought that openness on the part of the family is all the more remarkable given that sort of very complex um almost mendacious relationship that was going on in the heart of that family. Yes, I mean, it addresses what we were just talking about, her complicated, her complicated legacy, you know, that she's not a simple person. She was not a simple person to write about or read about. She must be, she was definitely not a simple person to be related to, to be the, yeah. to be the offspring of. So, you know, even, even late in life, I mean, as I said, you know, about, about Michael, Michael Hamburger, her, her eldest son, he was really conflicted about it right to the end of his life. Yeah. Well, that's terrific, Ben. Uh, thank you. That, that's, uh, there it is for all those at home. Uh, just get that into focus there, Agent mm -hmm. Sonia. I, I sort of speak as a fan, really, because I, I, I read all of your books when they come out, and I think they're, they're fantastic. Very they're fun. very well written, impeccably researched. And on that note, uh, we'll, we'll go over to questions. But, you know, I do heartily recommend it to everyone who's uh, watching and listening. So do, do rush out. Go and see Ben, the other Ben. Uh, and make sure you get a copy of it. So don't wonder. go, don't go anywhere, um, Roger, because um, <laughs> I kind of want your, you know, your feedback on questions as well. Okay. Um, I've had a, a little, a, a lovely variety of questions. Do keep them coming. Um, uh, Audrey, Audrey Dean, um, a good friend of mine. Um, fascinating discussion. In fifty years, what do you think you'll be writing about? Assuming would it be Trump and Russia? Uh, 
<laughs> well, I'll be 108. So that's going to be, I mean, I, I'll, I'll be writing pretty slowly is all I can tell you. If I'm still going, dribbling away onto my keyboard. Um, yes, I think that is a tremendous source of stuff. I mean, that story is going to take a huge amount of time to come out. And I'm still very unclear on, on what has happened in that, in that story. The whole Trump dossier, the whole steel dossier, that is still to be. But as I said, as we said earlier, it's going to be very difficult because I know that, that the intelligence services are, are, are wise now to the expectation that what they write and what they do will become public at some point. I mean, MI5 now pub declassifies its files. MI6 doesn't, but is under great pressure to do so and will do so at some point. It's going to be very hard for intelligence um, historians of the future because just finding the material is going to be very, very hard. The lawyers in MI5 crawl over everything before it even gets into the MI5 files. So, you know, what it's going to be like when and if it ever comes into the public domain is a really good question. And that's not just true of intelligence history, it's true of all history, I think. It's gonna be very hard to do. Where are we gonna find the text messages? You know, yeah. Google and, and Facebook are gonna you know, have a, already have a debt to history. They're gonna to have to tell us at some point everything. And that raises whole questions about privacy and, and security and so on. So it's a, it's a good question. I, I'd love to be writing about Trump and the Russians. I, I don't think that story's even started to be told. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, Jacqueline Sells, who's a good friend, um, she, do, you, do you think this book is reaching a wider audience than your other books because it, it's about a female agent um, and was Radio 4 Book of the Week, which precedes Women's Hour? Uh, there's obviously a, a, a women-centric element to that. She's, she, I mean, obviously she, uh, she lives in Chipping Norton as well. Which, uh, <laughs> there's obviously some uh, edge to that, which... Uh, Maybe, maybe Jack's is a spy. Does she make good scones, is the question. <laughs> Very near Ursula's dead drop site, which is where she left her, her messages and her material for her Soviet handlers. Um, yes, I hope so, obviously. You know, I mean, many of my previous books have, have, have been male-orientated simply because men tend to dominate this world. You know, that it is a very male-dominated business espionage. Um, I... I Yes, I hope so. I, I, I do hope so. And, and obviously, Book of the Week is just gold dust once you, once you get that. And, and Marie Duff, Duff did such a brilliant job of reading it. Um, it. I did take that on, as I said at the beginning, I took on the subject of a woman. And I don't mean this in a falsely modest way, but it's in, in, the, in the sort of cultural world we're in at the moment, appropriating the voice of another gender or another race or another ethnicity is a is a tricky thing to do you know you one has to be very careful about that and i was worried at times that oh gosh you know am i am, you know i'm not a woman i've never been pregnant i've never you know i've never i haven't baked a scone for a long time and i probably should have done but you know so there i am sort of abrogating to myself a, a woman's voice and i was worried at times that that would seem sort of out of kilter but as i say i was so lucky because ursula did write a lot of fiction in her later life although it was labelled as fiction, but it isn't really fiction. It is disguised autobiography. Her sons explained this to me, that really her way to get round the Stasi censors was to write what appeared to be fiction, but was really memoir. And that allowed me to get a proper insight into what she really felt at the different points of her life. Admittedly, she was looking back. They weren't written contemporaneously. And, and that, in a way, I felt that I had Ursula sort of in a way holding my hand mm. uh, and so therefore when I was when I was producing her voice as it were I was producing her voice these were the things that she had said I was never having to kind of imagine myself into a woman's skin because I had a woman's voice sitting right next to me and she wrote an awful lot I had to have it all translated I've got stacks of it um, and, and that so that reassured me and I do hope it sort of it talks to women in a, in a way. I mean, her struggle, if you like, the emotional struggle that is at the core of this is very much, I think, one that modern women struggle with. It's the, it's the work-life balance. It's how do, you, how, do you, how do you meet up, you know, motherhood and, 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 and domestic work life and, and, and being a wife and, you know, so on, with, with, with a job. The difference, of course, is that Ursula's work was lethal. I mean, it was, she wasn't, you know, it wasn't, you know, the, the cost of, the cost of her profession was, was not only her 
if she failed, it would just be her death. It would be the death of her family. So it's a different kind of work, if you like. But nonetheless, she interrogates herself frequently on the question of, you know, have I got this right? Am I, be, am I doing right by my job? Am I doing right by my beliefs? And am I doing right by my family? And that's one that will be, I hope, familiar. Well, not hope. I, I know it is familiar to many women mm. and men, actually. But it's, but, you know, it is one that we do associate with women's, modern women's life. I, I think, I think, sorry, I I, the answer is in the book. But, you know, how did she balance the whole kind of dropping the kids off at school and the kind of, uh, and then going off to spy on how you make atomic bombs? And well, <laughs> Right, as I said, to the end of her life, I think she struggled with it. I think she, she worried and she, she at times is harshly critical of herself and said, my children deserved a different mother, one who, a mother who would have been available. Well, the children all noticed long before they realized that she was a spy, long when they were children, they noticed she always slept in the afternoon. She was always taking an afternoon nap. Why did other mothers not take an afternoon nap? Well, the answer was that other mothers weren't up until four in the morning in the privy sending messages to Moscow. So, you know, it, it, it's, you know, the, the balance was, was, was very difficult, but she is, she's quite critical of herself. But there is a, a passage that some may find chilling where she said, look, her daughter got, she sent her daughter off, she found it was almost getting too much for her, and she sent her daughter off to boarding school, and her daughter got very ill, got, got appendicitis, and she brought her back, and she said, I will never, ever do that again, I will keep my children with me, unless there is the partisan struggle, unless I am called, a revolution breaks out, and I have to take up arms, so that, that to me was a signal, really, that had it come to a conflict, and it never really quite did, between a choice between her family and the revolution, she would have chosen the revolution. But we have to be careful in a funny way about double standards here because we, I've never asked of a male spy that I've written about before. I've never interrogated them on whether they were good fathers. Mm. You know, we don't, we, we don't really ask that question of, of men in that era because it wasn't really in some way expected of them. And so I think we do have to be careful of kind of projecting our own views of, of what parenthood involves these days, back in time uh, to others, particularly to women. Can I come in, Ben, with a, yeah, another yeah, question? Yeah, um, this is from uh, Kevin Bunce, who does say at, at the end, he says, P.S. Love your books. So that, Thank you, Kevin. That's, uh, that's good. Um, he asked, first of all, about sources, which is what I asked you before. But he, his second part of his question is interesting. Um, have you ever been lucky enough to talk firsthand to anyone involved? In this sort of espionage and if so how, how reliable would you consider an interview to be given it's you know 80 odd years uh, since well of course for this book there was no one living that i could still talk to there were her family there were her there were some friends there were there were younger people so so yes but of course one has to aim off on next generation sources you have to be yeah. tremendously careful my previous book the one before this uh, the story of oleg gordievsky uh, uh, the spy and the traitor that was based very securely on and i'm not exaggerating dozens of hours of interviews with the main protagonist with the main person in that story now now that has pitfalls as well you know i spent hours and hours in the safe house with with Oleg gordievsky and it, and it gave me I, I was fascinated by the end of it because i came to realize something that perhaps everybody has already realized about memory that our memories are very selective memory is a uh, is a is a kind of malleable and a sort of uh, and a kind of changing element the stories that we tell about ourselves are stories that we want to tell about ourselves that they're stories that we've often honed over time mm. i don't know if, if you've ever had the experience but if you tell a story and your sibling is standing next to you they will quite frequently at the end of the story say that's complete nonsense what you've just said it wasn't like that at all mm. and one of the strange things with with oleg who i spent as i said a lot of time with was that because I was also interviewing all the case officers involved in his story, on some tricky occasions, I would have to say to Oleg, actually, your story about what you think happened that day isn't right. Mm -hmm. You've got it wrong. Your memory isn't correct. Yeah. Yeah. And there would be this kind of slightly Slavic, tricky, hard stare that you'd get from Gordy. Say, and to his credit, he would always say, well, okay, you know my story better than I know it. I will, I will accept your, your decision. But I mean, so the answer is human sources and, and journalistic sources. Goodness knows, I mean, as, you know, as a journalist, I know this only too well. 
Yeah. Memory is memory is faulty. Memory can't be completely relied on, but often it's the only thing we have. So one of the things I constantly have to do in these books is to try to weigh up the veracity of what somebody thinks is the story of their own life yeah. with with what I know to be the reality from official sources and, and other sources. So it's a it's often a tricky balance. I, I had a, a similar experience with uh, a book I did uh, a while ago, Berlin at War, mm. for which I did a a sort of battery of interviews with the Berliners of the wartime generation. So they were then, you know, this was uh, came out 10 years ago. So they were then well into their uh, old age. And um, and that taught me, I did about 35 interviews for that book, but it, it taught me that uh, exactly as you said, that hit, that our memories are, are sort of very, I, I always liken it to a pudding stone. It's a sort of, there are bits of elements of fact in there. There are bits of other people's stories that we kind of subconsciously adopt. And then our brain sort of makes sense of the melange and turn it into a narrative. Yeah. Uh, and very often when you're doing oral history like that, you have to try and pick it apart. You're obliged to pick this apart. And not it's in, not dishonest. In a vicious it's not way. dishonest. No, it's, it's not that people are, are making up their pasts or trying to give you a no, false absolutely. impression. I think, it's often, a, I think that's what yeah. the brain does, is it tries to make sense of this, this sort of melange of, of information. And we always try to look back, don't we, on our lives, and everybody does this, as if they were somehow a logical progression yeah. of the things that have happened to us in life. You know, I felt this and I thought this and that and this. Often sort of life isn't like that. The only, the only contrast I can give you to that is, is Eddie Chapman, um, whose who's own both recorded and written account of his life is one of the most fundamentally dishonest things I've, <laughs> I've ever read, because almost every page of it is completely invented by him. Um, I mean, he was a tremendously unreliable chronicler yeah. of his own life because, of course, he didn't realise that eventually the MI5 files would come out and the truth would emerge. So the great fun of Agent Zigzag was taking what Eddie said about his own life and setting it against what one knew to be the truth and finding this enormous gulf between them. I mean, he was an absolutely, you know, lifelong and very brilliant liar. But exactly, I was going to say, I mean, as a double agent, I mean, life, uh, lying must become second nature. Well, you're right. And, and of you're course, in this area, one deals with a lot of people. Spies are tremendously good at making up the past, mm. you know, and, 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 and fabulating their own roles in, in what happened. So, but that's half the fun is trying to tease out what mm. is what is reality and what is kind of self-serving fiction. I have another another question here um, regarding uh, Oleg Gordievsky, as you just mentioned. So it's a good to lead on from that from this. This is from Maggie Stewart, and she says, uh, "In the light of the Litvinenko and Skripal cases, does Oleg Gordievsky now feel unsafe in the UK?" Well, I mean, the short answer is no, he doesn't, uh, for two reasons: one of personality and one of practicality. I mean, Oleg is under incredibly close security now. I mean, ever since those events, he, his, the safe house is now absolutely a ring of steel. There is a permanent person in the house. You know, he is under 24 hour electronic surveillance. Nobody's getting through that. So, but, but the other point is more of personality that Oleg went through such astonishing terror really in the course of his life that the fear of, of, of being attacked now is minimal compared. He's rather insouciant about it. In fact, mm -hmm. I mean, amusingly enough, he's, he's very slightly nettled by the, the Skripal case because he, right. he slightly feels that if anyone was going to be attacked, um, it, he thinks that Skripal is a slightly sort of second rate spy, really. I mean, that he wasn't really the most important, that Oleg himself is the most important, and that therefore if anyone was going to be attacked, it should be him. <laughs> That's good. Um, That's I'll, jump, I'll jump in with a few questions. I've got yes. um, a series of them. I'm, I'm, I'm conscious there's only five minutes left. So, um, Margaret Baxter, um, do you think there are other Ursulas uh, out there in England or were uh, in England um, now or back then? Well, Ursula, um, in, in the sort of Russian nomenclature, Ursula was a, a, an illegal agent, as distinct from a legal spy. So illegals are people who live under, under civilian cover. They appear to be melding into the society. And, and legals are, are people who are diplomats, but are, in fact, using diplomatic cover to work as, as, as intelligence officers. So she's an illegal. And there are... There are different sorts of illegals this day, but today, but there are plenty of them. There are many, many, many R 
Russian agents of influence, people who are providing information. There are lots of different grades of, of intelligence. And there are sleepers. There are plenty of, of people like Ursula. In fact, there was, a, I mean, not just in Britain, but in, in America and other parts of the West. I mean, we all remember that case with Anna Chapman, the famous, you know, she was known as the flamehead spy who was exposed by, by the FBI. But that was a huge network of long running sleeper agents, illegals that have been implanted in America over a long, long period. I mean, many of you will have seen the, the series, The Americans, which is great fun and, and good drama, but it's not a million miles away from the truth. There, there have always, the Russians have been brilliant at this for, for, for getting on for a century now at implanting people in foreign countries under civilian cover and allowing them just to meld into the background and, and, and often not be activated for many, many years. Anna, Anna H, has anyone suggested this would work well? Um, she's put as a documentary, but for TV, whether, uh, whether it be a, you know, a, a fictional piece or uh, whatever. So funny you should mention that, but um, it's, I've, in fact, I've just sold the TV rights to, to Agent Sonia, which is incredibly exciting, um, for, for a, an eight part television series, which I'm, I'm thrilled about. I, but I can't tell you who's doing it yet because I, still sort of slightly under, under wraps, but, but I'm thrilled about that because I, if one did this story as a, as a film, as a 90 minute film, you'd have to do it in great role writing. It would be a sort of adventure and escape story. It'd be great fun, but with eight episodes, with eight hours of television, you could really, I think, get into the, open the weft of this story, you know, the kind of the details of the spycraft, Shanghai, Poland, Manchester, Switzerland, Britain, Great Royal, you know, there's, there are so many different scenes that you could do it through that I'm thrilled. So I, I hope that will, I hope that will come to pass. I, I know from experience that, it, you know, simply selling the rights doesn't necessarily end up um, with anything appearing on screen, but I'm, I, I'm very hopeful for that one. I think it might, it might happen. Brilliant, that's good news. Um, Mike James, did you end up actually liking Ursula? I think you kind of sort of answered that sort of late on with your discussion with Roger, but... I liked her with reservations. I mean, I think if I had met her, I would have liked her greatly. She had a kind of electric effect on people, Ursula. She, she was not conventionally beautiful, but she, boy, did she, did she stir up the, 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 the people around her, men and women. I mean, so she was intensely attractive. And as I say, good fun. There was a core of steel, which I think, you know, people who are zealots, and she was undoubtedly a zealot for much of her life, are kind of often be rather unattractive people. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not keen on people who, who believe they know the truth and try to tell other people what it is. So I think I would have found that aspect of her character quite difficult. But yes, I did like her. I did like her. I thought she was, in many respects, incredibly admirable. She was just got it wrong. Yes. Uh, Maggie, uh, did Ursula, when she got out of Britain to East Germany, I think she was quite old by then, um, when she left to East Germany, take her children with her husband? I suspect not. Is that? No, she did. Okay. No, I mean, that was one of the things. And she wasn't actually that old. She was still only 41 when she escaped from Britain. Um, so she was, she was still, she wasn't even, you know, she was in early middle age. And she took her two younger children with her. They, they kind of flitted overnight. Uh, her eldest son, Michael, was at university in Aberdeen at that point. I mean, he, you know, he had absolutely no idea what was going on. Len, her husband, had broken his leg in a motorcycle accident, so he had to stay behind. Um, and she just, she just vanished to East Germany and set up, um, set up shop anew there. So, no, she, she did, and Len eventually joined her, and then Michael, the eldest son, also joined her in the end. So she recreated her family back there. What's so, in a way funny about it is that months after her departure mi5 was still collectively scratching its head she was very strange the uh the housey great role right there's nobody in it we can't work out where she's gone i mean it was absolutely extraordinary that they didn't step in to stop her yeah. you're saying that it should be making it made into a film it sounds like it should be an ealing comedy well i know bits of it are very funny i think and ursula was alive in a way to the absurdity of her situation herself. I mean, she, she had a great sense of humor and I think a lot of spying is completely ridiculous. I mean, all that kind of dead drop and spy craft and recognition signals and so on. And, and, and she knew that at, at core, it was quite funny what was going on. Yeah. We're gonna, we're gonna run a couple of minutes over. I hope you don't mind. Is that okay with you guys? No, that's fine. 
Um, so Anna H, uh, following up a couple of questions from the TV, actually Audrey, um, who would you cast as Ursula? I suppose a quick question. Um, gosh. In your head, who is she? Um, I don't know. Who's, who's that brilliant actress who played Feebag? Uh, Walla Bridge. Yeah. Oh, yes. Phoebe oh, Walla Bridge. Yeah. I think she'd be utterly brilliant at it because she's like, she plays like very eccentric characters and, and who are not obviously heroines. And I think she'd, she'd play a brilliant Ursula. That's my guess. Uh, Anna, how did her children find out? Is that giving too much away? Uh, and Anna H also asked, um, who named her Sonia? Uh, the, the first question is, they found out when she published her autobiography, when she published her memoir in, in, in 1977. That was the first they knew of what their mother had really been doing. And it was a shattering moment for them. They were furious, as you would be. Um, Agent Sonia was the code name allocated to her by Ricard Sorge, who was both her recruiter in Shanghai and her lover. Um, and, and Sonia carried a kind of uh, emotional and romantic story within it because it was a song. There was a song in Russian that was sung in the Shanghai nightclubs of the 20s, which was Sonia is dancing with a Russian man. When you look into her eyes, you can't help but fall in love with her. So it was also sort of Sorge's parting love symbol to, to, to Ursula. And the entanglement of emotion and romance and espionage in Ursula's life carried throughout. Fantastic. Okay. Um... Stephen Rees, to Roger, thank you for asking good conversational questions. Well done, Roger. Uh, to Ben, much enjoyed reading your previous books, uh, e.g. Operation Mincemeat and the SAS. Would Ursula have been aware of the Portland spies? Question. And to both Ben and Roger, are you able to say what your next books will be? Uh, when will they be available? I suppose, what are they? Um, uh, she would not have been aware of the Portland spies. That was a discreet... KGB run operation. Ursula was Soviet military intelligence. She was what would become the GRU. So, and, and in the compartmentalized way of, of Russian espionage, she wouldn't have known about the Portland spies. They might have been brought in to help her if she needed them, that, but, but no, she wouldn't have done. And um, the, I am writing, my next book is, is a history of Colditz, believe it or not. I'm going back to, um, to that story that we all remember so well from the 70s and 80s, but actually the real story of Golditz is, is so different um, from our mythologized story of men with elaborate moustaches building gliders in the attic, although there's a lot of that going on. Um, it, the real story is, is both bleaker and stranger and more extraordinary than, than anything. It's a, it's a great tale, Golditz. Wonderful. Uh, and th my next one uh, is on uh, a, a diplomatic uh, effort during the during the war to forge Latin American passports to, to help Jews uh, survive the Holocaust, uh, which is a little known story that I'm going to uh, blow open Ben McIntyre style. Excellent. Can't wait. <laughs> That's what historians are for. Absolutely. Finding little known stories and blowing them out. But, uh, um, I think that might be every question. Well, Margaret added, what happened to Len? Dear old Len, I mean, he also ended up in, he was a slightly hapless figure, he ended up in, in East Germany as well, but he, he never really learned German. And he, he, he sort of slight, I think at the end of it, it was a bit tricky for poor old Len. He, he didn't really enjoy East Germany. And he, I think he really wanted to come back to the Oxfordshire countryside, but he, he was okay. And the, and the marriage continued actually very happily. And he, he died in the, I think he died in the early 90s. Uh, no, sorry, the late 80s. So he didn't pre predecease her by much. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, Roger, do you want to finish with a little closing thing about... Yeah, um... I would just uh, sort of repeat myself from earlier on. I think you, know, you consistently produce um, brilliant books, wonderfully researched, wonderfully written, crucially. I'm a big fan of well-written, well-researched history. I think those are two bases that we have to cover as authors, and you consistently do that. There's a reason why you're at the, on the bestseller lists, Ben, it's because your books are bloody good. So uh, congratulations again. And uh, again, to all of our listeners this evening, if you haven't already got one, go out and buy one. Roger, thank you so much. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed this evening. Thank you very much, Ben. Thank you, Roger, for, for having me on. What a treat. Thank you. Pleasure.